Welcome everyone to another episode, the third in Towards a Metapsychology That is True to Transformation. Um, and I am at, uh, joined as always uh, in this series with uh, two excellent interlocutors and partners on this journey, uh, Greg Enriquez and Zachary Stein. So I'll let them both quickly introduce themselves. And then we're going to turn things over to Zach, maybe pick up a few of the threads from last time and then take us into uh, what we're going to focus on today. So perhaps we'll start with Greg and then we, you know, we'll go to Zach. Perfect. That sounds good. Uh, so as we've entered now to this territory where we've problematized transformation a bit, uh, last conversation was problematizing psychology and I got all fired up, um, but we were able to get calmed down and get oriented because, uh, uh, and I think that now we're in a real excellent place uh, to hand it over to Zach and, and start a process of a real sophisticated uh, deep, rich developmental view. Yeah, thank you. This has been a joy, and I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it's I don't know what to say. I used to have a lecture I gave when I taught, uh, actually at Harvard, and it was everything you've been taught about Piaget is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to rehearse that entire one here, but you guys you'll be getting some of that. Uh, you know, it's interesting because the the problem of transformation. A, first occurred to me and this specific problematization of it, which is to say that it demands a sophisticated metapsychology. Um, this first occurred to me uh, before I really became a psychologist when I was just trying to look at education as a problem that needed to be solved. Um, mm. And <clears throat> it became very clear that education is such a complex human endeavor that you can't use one discipline to think about it well. Right, right. Um, like you can't just use psychology. You can't just use philosophy. You can't just use economics. You can't just use organizational theory. Like there's many bits and pieces. So it demands a radical interdisciplinarity. Um, uh, even just the philosophy of education, <clears throat> which I ended up specializing in, uh, was forced all, you couldn't just be do ethics and philosophy of education or just epistemology and, or just aesthetics and philosophy of education. You had to do all of them in philosophy of education by demand. Dewey said something like all the problems of philosophy come to a head in the problem of education. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> right at the core of this is the problem of transformation and specifically preferable transformation mm -hmm. and the distinction between change and learning and mm -hmm. behavioral adaptation and increasing understanding and a whole bunch of complex issues which are entangled around this issue of transformation which demand interdisciplinarity, like at a very, at a very deep totally. level. Um, uh, so that's where it kind of first huh. dawned on me that you can't proceed in some of these fields without getting some meta theoretical apparatus in place, basically. Yep. And this is what, in some sense, and this is of course an idealization, you know, broadly speaking, a humanitarian education would provide. It would provide that mm -hmm. sense of, okay, you're a specialist here, but there's all of this other stuff going on, which is important to any problem you're trying to solve. And so, yeah, in particular, um, transformation, uh, then the scientific understanding of transformation uh, factored prominently in educational reform, uh, like mod what we would call modern education reform. So, you know, I became a psychologist in many ways because it was <clears throat> so important to understand psychology to get educational systems working. Right. <laughs> Hopefully Zach will be back soon. We're back. Yes, we're back. We're back. Okay. Exactly what happened there. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I think it's my internet. It's happened before today, so forgive me. Okay. Um, All right. I said a swear. I hope it didn't end up on the recording. No, it so, didn't. So it didn't. It's, it's very judicious. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So, so I was going to say real fast as you pause, please. just uh, the uh, interface or circle or feedback between philosophy and education. Uh, clearly has lots of parallels with what I've found myself in relationship to the science of psychology and the practice, the therapeutic practice. Like there, there's that 
feedback loop between theory and practice that I think in praxis that is really, and seeing it in relationship the way you've laid out philosophy and the metadisciplinary knowledge of our knowledge and then how to convey that and cultivate it in a way that fosters transformation is a, I'm just noting a very obvious parallel in that regard. Yeah, and and specifically like a, a form of practice that's like an ameliorative <laughs> humanitarian endeavor where the application of science is different than in like, let's say other engineering fields <laughs> where you yep. can apply science uh, to build a bridge or a weapon right. or something like that. And so there's a, there's a way that the science of psychology is applied in these domains like education and psychotherapy that, that gr even, even further greaten the burden of interdisciplinarity because it brings ethics in, totally. it brings other things in. And so the metapsychological burden is greater on you, Greg, <clears throat> than it would be if you were, let's say, just doing a narrow experimental paradigm, a narrow narrow experimental paradigm in an fMRI scanner, trying to produce science for science sake. <laughs> there's still issues there, <laughs> yep. But uh, there's the complexity uh, in the practice of education and psychotherapy, where you're recommending to people uh, ways that they ought to be, right? Hundred percent. You know, and that's what we'll get to towards the end of this is how do we actually theorize something like teacherly authority? which is this complex construct that I've published about in, in my book, which, which is exactly that. It's a position which has existed, a, a kind of social role relation, which has existed in all cultures, right. <laughs> uh, which is the relationship of intergenerational transmission and, and even more specifically the normative relation of being able to advise one in what is right for them uh, with vis-a-vis -vis your greater knowledge. Uh, and their recognition of your greater knowledge. And so that requires a developmental approach um, specifically. And <clears throat> so that was just a long way of saying <laughs> that like this issue has been on my mind since I've been taking ideas very seriously. I've been grappling with the fact that we're not adequately equipped to solve some of these really complex social problems like the social problems trying to be solved by psychotherapists or educators. Um, or like a macro meaning crisis. <laughs> or a macro meaning crisis, right, which is, yeah, exactly. Don't. I, I just wanted to say uh, uh, something similar to what Greg just did, um, which is of course, cognitive science is by definition an interdisciplinary practice, uh, precisely because these issues of meaning and knowledge and cognition are taken to not be capturable by any one of the home disciplines. So I think, uh, we independently came to a similar conclusion. That's why I ended up in cognitive science. And one of the things I want to put on the table, and I, I expect you'll be able to respond to it in depth, is, of course, there's a particular problem. That's, you know, there's a problem in cognitive science, which is each one of the home disciplines has its own language, has its own ontology, has its own methods, has its own data, the, the kinds of events that it counts as evidence. And so they, I often liken it to different countries speaking different languages or different religions. And so, there, I mean, there's, a, there's an additional problem that you're facing. Uh, I don't mean you particular. I mean, anybody who says this phenomena requires interdisciplinary approach, which is how do we create the, the bridging discourse uh, between them that allows us to map between them insightfully without, you know, without, you know, papering over the relevant and important differences. So how to complexify, if you'll allow me, uh, the problem of how to complexify the various disciplines together is a problem um, I'd like, uh, to, I hope we can bring into at some point in this discussion, because it's a problem that's very dear to my heart uh, about this issue. And, and I think, I, I totally agree with you um, that um, there, the, uh, the response, the, the attempt to understand and also respond both pedagogically and therapeutically to the issue of transformation requires an interdisciplinary approach. I think that there's also the possibility, and this might this this is something that's more nuanced and perhaps we won't get to it, that in a, we can actually exemplify part of what we're trying to examine. What do I mean by that? As I think we're we exemplify complexification and how it can properly work. And that can give us some guidance about how we can understand the complexification processes at work within transformation itself. So we can use that as, I'm not saying as any kind of final authority, but as a normative yardstick by which we say, well, look, this is how we do this well here when we're trying to do this, it, right, in the practice of the knowledge. 
maybe that will give us some guide as to how we should make normative recommendations in the practice of uh, the, the pedagogy or, or the therapy. That, so that's just something I wanted to put on the table for discussion. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I'll take the first issue uh, first. Uh, and I, it's funny, you, you directed right what I ended up studying in grad, I ended up studying interdisciplinarity as, uh, in, as an endeavor. Um, mm. Yeah, there's actually been quite a bunch of uh, interesting empirical work done on <clears throat> the nature and dynamics of interdisciplinarity at a very mm-hmm. high level. Um, I worked at Project Zero um, at the Graduate School of Education, uh, uh, Veronica Boyax Mansala, um, the International Baccalaureate. There were several places mm-hmm. where interdisciplinarity was like being looked at as a as an educational problem, and I looked at it in terms of like what are the cognitive and emotional task demands of interdisciplinarity. I ended up finding this amazing man who most people have not heard of, uh, Donald Campbell. You guys may have. Huh. Great. Yeah. He's old Campbell. school, but <laughs> prolific, yeah. completely yeah. prolific and uh, uh, kind of like, um, you know, pioneer in this field of evolutionary epistemology specifically. Okay. And yes. looked at the yep. problem. he looked at the problem of interdisciplinarity from, the inter, from that lens of evolutionary epistemology. And he identified what he called the ethnocentrism of the disciplines, which is a very useful phrase. And so he yep. identified that like, there are these kind of like no man's lands between yes. disciplines. Yeah. And yeah. to get comprehensiveness, we need to be able to communicate in a very different way. But this, <clears throat> this ethnocentrism of the disciplines, it's very deep seated and isn't, it's an educational problem. It has to do with the way we train disciplinarians in many ways, um, but it's also a cognitive problem. And this is, this is where we'll get to again towards the end when we look at the model of hierarchical complexity and the neo Piagetian models of, you know, adult development mm-hmm. to get to your point of like to go circular mm-hmm. is that it's actually very hard to do interdisciplinary work just cognitively, um, yes. especially without, uh, shared scaffolds and that's what meta theoretical or meta psychological models like greg's or mine or like wilbur's or washburn's or yours john the help interdisciplinarians actually yeah. think about yeah. <laughs> the nature of what they're doing is it's a scaffold to take the cognitive load off the shared language and so piaget in his work in the 70s for unesco was trying to identify this he was trying to identify uh, a language of structuralism that could be used to bridge uh, disciplinary boundaries and create a, a comprehensive field of knowledge that we could use to reform society. It was very important work. Um, and uh, the idea there he was that, <clears throat> and it ended up being articulated by some of the dynamical systems guys, was that, oh, wait, there are processes which are isomorphic across different levels of complexity. Yeah, right. um, and that's, so I'll get there. I'm going to foreshadow that. So I'm gonna, but I'm going to rewind, if that's okay, to the mm-hmm. To where I ended up in graduate school, which was looking at the history of psychology to figure out how it became so fragmented um, and trying to also get my chops strong enough in philosophy that I could do the interdisciplinary work I needed. Right. <clears throat> and so I was looking at Charles Sanders Peirce, right. who I became obsessed with. Uh, and you know, he, he is actually the first experimental psychologist on the North American continent. People don't realize this, but he performed the first psychological experiments on the continent. And he was translating Wundt and in communication mm-hmm. with Wilhelm Wundt uh, and mm-hmm. was working in both phenomenology and the early psychophysics. And he was a mathematician and a metrologist. So he set up very precise experimental apparatus. This is an amazing story to, to test the logarithmic reliability of his eye as a differential responder to subtle variations in the intensity of light. Again, so he (laughs) set up like a a chronograph or whatever it was Mm -hmm. called, which was, which he could set through measures showed light varied, brighter, less bright. And so he's like, can I, is my eye reliable or not Mm -hmm. as a gauge? And it turned out it is very reliable to certain thresholds. And those are logarithmic, just like all the rest of the psychophysical stuff. Here's where it gets more interesting. He was a polymath. He did that to be able to justify his astronomical Mm. observations of stars, which are of varying intensities, because he had a hypothesis, which had been posited before, even by some Greeks, that were in a disk, right? 
that we are in a disc that is the Milky Way galaxy. <clears throat> and he was like, I can tell these ones are brighter. These ones are less bright. Like mathematically, this is a disc. And he ended up doing that whole thing. But in the process of doing that, he did this experimental work in psychophysics. Uh, first experiments done in North America. His good friend, William James, was also taking the experimental psychology from Europe and trying to build something with it. And what Peirce found there was what Frege ended up calling the problem of psychologism. Right. right. Which is that there are totally some processes that we would call psychical processes, like psych my processes of the mind, which are like natural, like these logarithmic psychophysical things, which are kind of shown and proven. But then there are other ones which are not. And now we're back to the space of reasons and the space of causes. Yeah. So this was like putting his finger on this very precisely, very early in the psychological discussions. And it actually changed the tone of some American psychologists, not James. James didn't really understand it, <laughs> mm -hmm. but Baldwin did and George Herbert Mead did uh, mm. and, and Dewey did. Um, and that made American psychology uh, for a time different. Um, and so Baldwin in particular picked up on this notion that there were mm -hmm. developmental processes um, that like the ones that Darwin had detected, mm -hmm. but they, they were in your mind, they were in the culture, um, uh, that there was a developmental or evolutionary process <clears throat> taking place when the child went from being unable to speak or do anything to being able to do mathematics and grammar and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and so he articulated that as a form of interdisciplinary work that supervened on comparative psychology and psychophysics. So he had a, a much more complex stack of what psychology was and said, that stuff's interesting, but we can solve that with naturalistic methodologies, yep. kind of. Mm -hmm. Then there's this layer of stuff, which gets us into the justification system and beyond, um, which uh, we can't, it, there's isomorphic processes. So it's not that we can't study it. And it's not that it's not bound by the lower level processes, mm -hmm. but it is distinct. And it brings us into this normative domain where we have to deal with what I call last time normative facts. Um, and so, you know, Baldwin's work, um, Thought and Things, this like three volume magnum opus, which is completely forgotten, completely incredible, foreshadows speech act theory, foreshadows um, uh, several other areas in like pragmatics and linguistics. Of course, it's, it's what inspired Piaget to do yep. his work, um, specifically pulling from Baldwin. Um, you know, Baldwin was pulling from Pierre Genet and Tarde, who were French um, uh -huh. and had a uh -huh. deeply grounded intersubjective and normative yeah. approach to development, but completely respecting biology. Baldwin made contributions just like Peirce and multiple sciences. Baldwin is most famous for the Baldwin effect, which yeah. is actually uh -huh. something yeah. biology. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he was not as many people characterize him <clears throat> taking psychology up into speculative domains. He was actually trying to, to have this full stack psychology and to position his work, the specifically the, what he called genetic epistemology, which just means yep. developmental epistemology. And that's right. exactly the phrase Piaget ended yep. up using yep. that yep. Right. Yep. genetic epistemology or developmental epistemology or evolutionary epistemology is that notion where you apply that way of thinking about how evolution worked and you transform it, you don't bring it wholesale and reduce <laughs> the emergent, right. right? But you transform yeah. it and you start to do work in, in development. So that's where this thing gets launched and loaded. And then Piaget basically picks it up in France. I mean, this is not, this is my reading. <laughs> it's a reconstruction that's useful. <clears throat> of course, there's more complexity because Piaget also worked with uh, Pierre Genet. Baldwin ends up in France, exiled from the United States, ends up mm. in France given the Legion of Honor by France for his work in World War I. And um, uh, so there's a possibility that Piaget and Baldwin actually met. Um, but uh, in any case, so that, that was interesting. And that, when I was looking at that, I was seeing that there were, um, before the psychologists that I was hanging out with were telling me how psychology worked, there was weird things Which, happening in psychology. Yeah, that's super, I just wanna just highlight, cause this has become super salient to me that Basic comparative animal psychology is fundamentally different than human psychology. I mean, and, and that, that the proper um, lexicon and reference points for our language needs to, needs to accord that. And then I, I, you know, sort of had that. And then I rediscovered a lot 
of the developmentalists. And, and obviously you, you've layered that with a level of specificity that far exceeds my own. But it, it, to capture that in the history, after I sort of like, you know, did my TOK thing was like, well, shit, there's obviously animal mental behavior, mental process, and there's culture person behavior, mental. And for a whole host of reasons, <laughs> those are two different fields right. uh, of consideration. Yeah. And the field itself sort of knows that, and it sort of doesn't know that. And it's really been fascinating. Right. And there's a few people who picked up the lead, like Tomasello, I think, plugged mm-hmm. like directly into the story that I just told, like yep. he's mm-hmm. Mead and Perceive Insights. Yep. And then he's into Brandom. And so there's a, there's a recognition of what you're saying, I think, which is, which is that, you know, to do psychology doesn't mean to do one or the other. <laughs> it actually means to factor it all in a broader right. metapsychological frame, um, which, is, which is what I think Baldwin was attempting to do. Peirce gotcha. gave up on psychology. He was so bored by the psychophysics and thought James had just made all these mistakes and was trying to do philosophy, like meta architectonic yep. work that would allow for psychology to justify itself at all. And he thought that it basically couldn't. Um, yep. So <clears throat> but what's interesting about Piaget is that like Baldwin, he's also a biologist. Like he's fundamentally approaching human behavior as a, as a biologist. Um, uh, and, you know, his approach uh, to understanding behavior was one of uh, looking for taxonomical organization. Yep. Then transformative explanation between different positions in the taxonomy. So he's, mm-hmm. again, adopting the kind of Darwinian way of thinking to the kind of species and kind of, uh, you know, genre of the, of the, of the mind as the mind evolves. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, so he's, yeah, please. So I just want to be clear that I make sure I understand that. Like one of the things I hear both of you saying, um, I'm not that familiar with Baldwin, and I should be, given what you just said. I, I'm, I'm familiar with Person. I'm familiar with. It was me. in Toronto, actually. Was that the? Yeah, was I know that. The, that. I know that. At the University of Toronto, that's where the first laboratory of psychology was yes. established, the North American yeah. continent. Yeah. And uh, one of my uh, fellow grad students, Christopher Green, has done a documentary about yes. how he was actually purged. Uh, yes. He was purged. Uh, uh, but I, what, I, what I hear you saying, and of course this resonates with Piaget, is the, uh, I'm not totally happy with this adjective, but just let me use it. The hard science that they're looking to is biology, where I see people like Watson and Skinner, even though they're working with animals, the hard science they're trying to emulate is physics. Is that, is that a fair comparison uh, to make? I think what's, what's interesting here is that you already had back in those days, and Peirce was involved in this, and Piaget was literally focused on this problem was, you know, there are biologists who think biology should just be physics. <laughs> so there's this question of yeah, right. ontology basically. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, Piaget in particular was working with a way of thinking about biological processes that I think was probably more sophisticated than most of the biologists of his day, um, which is to say he was, following Waddington's work uh, and looking at self-organizing dynamical systems and processes of canalization and chaos, like way before that stuff was cool. (laughs) Uh, And so uh, there's a way in which the notions of biology that Skinner and Watson were working with were biological, but they were that simplistic biology that seeks to reduce biology to basically um, physics. Uh, We still have biology of that nature. I, I would say it's definitely true of Watson. Skinner's yeah. tricky. Um, Skinner, yeah. I took me a while to crack what radical behaviorism really is about. Um, and it's not, he's, he, if you read Skinner carefully, he's like, I'm not a stimulus uh, response reductionist at all. In mm. fact, he's actually a holistic empiricist who wants to eschew explanation and just engage in inductive control of behavior. So he actually doesn't really want to reduce anything to explanation even. He wants to control the flow of behavior is actually what he thinks. So essentially for Skinner, science really is an engineering project to generate a feedback loop of prediction and control of what you see, which is a fun, which is a weird thing, but it's not, it's very different. And in some ways, way more sophisticated than Watson. Watson was completely, he was a physical reductionist. Uh, he believed in the natural science, the, the physics as the exemplar for psychology, both epistemologically in terms of experimentation and ontologically in terms of its billiard balls, neural reflexes bouncing in front. Skinner was radically different in the way he approached behaviorism. 
Yeah, Skinner will get you because he's a, ultimately utopian. <laughs> yeah, he's a weird. I mean, he wins humanistic awards. He's a yeah. he's a fascinating character. It took me a while. I I, I was frustrated with him because I was on the cognitive side of the equation, and then I got in this huge entanglement, and then I actually learned how to speak radical behaviorism, and it's fascinating. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's helpful. helpful to know. So hmm. the, the 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 sticking point then, right, in the biology being reduced to physics is precisely Darwinian theory which is one of the two grounding theories of biology, because mm -hmm. it's ultimately a dynamical system theory. Yeah. It, it is not, right, a standard Newtonian kind of theory okay. in any way. That's, so is, is, is Baldwin picking up on that aspect? Is that what he's focusing on? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Baldwin is, so the, Bal the Baldwin effect specifically yeah. Yeah. Is, is a biological mechanism that can account for Lamarckian style evolutionary advancing yes, yes. via Darwinian style explanationary mechanisms, explanationary mechanisms. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting. So he's, he's thinking in a very complex way about how dynamic life is when it's in adaptation and what Piaget called equilibration, yeah. which he believed was a concept that applied across all the layers in the strata ontologically yep. that you can think about physics in terms of equilibration. You can think about biology in terms of equilibration. You can think about psychological process in terms of equilibration. So it's a very broad generalization. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, then you get that dis disequilibration yep. accommodation triplicate up in the psychological theorizing that, that, that Piaget does. Um, so, so yeah, so I think there's, there's a way of looking at uh, the kind of metapsychology we're proposing. And I think this is kind of what's in your question, John, or, or maybe not, but it's that it also involves a re-understanding of biology. Yeah. <laughs> like that if you hold some, for, for example, if you don't believe Darwin is actually a kind of like Evo Devo guy ultimately, mm -hmm. but you think Darwin's ultimately more like a Watsonian billiard balls, mm -hmm. causal randomness guy. Uh, which is not <laughs> like no, no. Darwin writes about love a lot, incidentally, um, and about natural selection, that phrase specifically very little. Uh, the, so, but if, but if you don't believe that, if you're a simplistic Darwinian, then it becomes very hard to have an adequate, even biology to do an adequate psychology. Uh, mm -hmm. And so one of our arguments here is that the meta psychology forces us into metaphysics, which has to reconfigure many of the adjacent disciplines to, so totally. psychology, which is what, which is what pissed people off about Piaget, <laughs> because he was basically, you know, so he would study a problem like causality and he would study little kids and he's at the Rousseau Institute for genetic epistemology in Switzerland. And he would invite all, he would invite physicists, he would, and like philosophers, Carnap would come. And, mm -hmm. and so they would both study how little kids were developing causal reasoning. And they'd study the most sophisticated scientific forms of causal reasoning and the most sophisticated epistemological, basically reflection on what causality is. So that would be like the summer. And then they would publish all of these things. Most of those haven't been translated. We get this little trickle and it hasn't been systematically translated. Whereas Freud and Jung's work are like super systematically translated. So there's something weird about the hmm. negligence that's paid to Piaget's corpus. It's French. It's not like they're, it's not hard to translate French. So, and it's weak. Some of the translations are bad um, that we do have. So that work was radically interdisciplinary and was actually <clears throat> Piaget's work with children was forcing epistemologists and physicists to be like, whoa, that's pretty interesting, <laughs> you know, because uh, it's just bizarre how different children think from mm -hmm. adults and yet mm -hmm. they turn into adults mm -hmm. pretty reliably. Um, so there are these really stable states that most children pass through in thinking about causality, which can be reliably seen, detected. Like it's like a species in the woods that you discover. <laughs> like, you know, that, that way of thinking about causality is there. Yeah. And so what's interesting is that many of those early species of the mind linger into adulthood. Um, if you take a sophisticated Neo-Piagetian view, this is where it becomes with the kind of like straw man Piaget, we just have to get rid of. <laughs> and we have to take development as this very complex thing where under certain conditions of duress, uh, you can start thinking about causality super magically, <laughs> mm. like very much like a kid thinks about causality. And that's a stable, predictable kind of almost archetype of psychological functioning, that mm. way of thinking about causality. Mm. 
And um, so, so that was a long way around of saying that, yeah, there's something implied here in our meta psychology that we're kind of building, which can handle transformation that forces us to rearticulate other aspects of other fields like biology, I think most importantly. Um, uh, and so, <clears throat> yeah, so, so Piaget gave us this kind of approach, which was trying to bring psychology into resonance with the other fields that were next to it, um, instead of in some weird disconnect. And so he did this work I already mentioned for UNESCO, this three volumes on mm -hmm. interdisciplinarity, uh, and then the, you know, the place of the science, the place of the human sciences and the system of sciences, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then structuralism, which is the most famous of those three, which were all attempts to articulate uh, a transdisciplinary language of transformation across mm -hmm. life, mind, and culture. Mm -hmm. Very, very ambitious, uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, the work that I was doing in my medicine, I didn't call it meta psychology, then I called it meta theory, or, but I was taking from, from Piaget. And he was seeing that there were, as I was saying, isomorphic structures across these three categories. He didn't name them this, but I named them this in retrospect, the natural, the normal, and the normative. Yep. It was do a lot of work for us, basically. Um, yep. And so natural processes are not <clears throat> they're biological processes, but they're pretty causal, right? So like, not simply causal. So like, let's take my blood sugar, right? Mm -hmm. My blood sugar is complex, um, but ultimately it is a, it's a natural, my organism should be naturally functioning. My blood sugar regulations in the domain of the natural. If it's not working and I have hypoglycemia, let's say, or diabetes, then there's a dysfunction, right? In a system which is predictable, it can actually be measured using causal mechanisms. Um, the normal is different. The normal supervenes directly on that, but interfaces with the distinctly human realm of the cultural, which is in the normative, right? Yep. So I like to use the example of dyslexia, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. so I'm dyslexic. So I have a, I have a atypical neural visual setup, like, which is genetic. Um, mm -hmm. My dad was also dyslexic. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and so in a culture that doesn't require me to read from the kind of alphabet we have, this nervous system is not necessarily a problem at all. Sorry. Mm -hmm. right. But in a culture that does, I get, I have a disability <laughs> as a category, which is interesting, which has to do with what's normal and the way what's natural fits into what's normal. Um, and so there's a whole range of categories there, especially in educational psychology, which become very interesting about, you know, what is actually not unnatural, which is to say that's what the organism does. <laughs> Sometimes with this genetic variation in these contexts, it's going to do that. That's natural. In a context where, well, that's not normal here, right? Here we sit in desks for six hours a day and focus on meaningless work. <laughs> but no, but if you put a 10 year old kid, if you put a 10 year old kid in that situation, it's natural that he's gonna be restless and not be able to focus, right? Well, no that's a disability or maybe actually a dysfunction, right? Uh, therefore, how do we intervene? So, and then there's, so there's, dis, there's dysfunction, there's disability, which has to do with the interface of the natural and the normative. And then there's what I would call disagreements, right? Mm -hmm. Which are not disabilities or dysfunctions. And you see in some psychiatry and even in political propaganda, the reduction of disagreement to disability, right? Yep. And more dangerously, the reduction of disability to, to dysfunction. Uh, so which is to say that you hold a view that I disagree with means you're basically broken or disabled or mm -hmm. stupid <laughs> or worse, deeply troubled and perhaps have a dysfunction. <laughs> uh, and so we talked last time about the medicalization of educational underperformance. Um, we also see the medicalization of political deviance, right? The medicalization of political disagreement uh, is actually going on in our culture right now quite totally. a bit. Uh, so when you're looking at Piagetian comprehensive structuralism, you're looking at a structuralism that has language that's relevant to psychology across those three 
broad categories of the natural the kind of causal regulative self-regulating organ like neuroscience kind of the hard sciences as it were and then you get this the, the, the kind of normal which studies bracketing cultural normativity studies the sociologically predictable which is where we get a lot of our psychology you take a sophomore from undergrad who's from a western democracy who's probably He's white weird <laughs> you put it yeah you put him in an the FMRI, weird category you put him in an fmri scanner and you see what he does and you bracket all the normative stuff that actually requires the creation of the experimental paradigm where it actually makes sense to him like that that image is disturbing and that image is not disturbing for example right you just bracket that you're looking at the normal responsiveness of someone enculturated in this culture and then you sometimes universalize that as if it's <laughs> but that's another conversation and then the normative which is where piaget was operating had to do with well, what about these normative facts right what about right. the fact that it the kid who's 16 thinks better about causality than the kid who's four full stop right like the kid at 16 will build a successful operating causal mechanism <laughs> without much instruction the kid at four will never build it without a lot of scaffolding right mm -hmm. now there's exceptions and this was like the let's take out piaget with a sniper rifle by setting up experimental paradigms that don't actually respect respect his assumptions but that's just the truth and so there's a there's a normativity built into this way of thinking about the normative facts in the domain of the normative, which you don't find in, in the normal or the, or the natural. And this is where we get into psychotherapy, education, uh, specifically forms of human development beyond adolescence, where you're looking at this hierarchically structured system of justification, right? Um, yep. And the dynamic of teacherly authority, which says often, and when it's most profound, not just that I know more than you quantitatively, but that the way I justify my beliefs is actually better than the way you justify your beliefs. Right, right, right. Right? That's a deeper claim. It's not just more quantitative knowledge. Like, nope. come to me and I can give you responses, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is how we think of like quiz show, you know, like, yep. <clears throat> but in fact, the, the, the real stance of teacherly authority is one that hits a deeper thread, which we can unpack in terms of, Greg's work on the justification system and the model of hierarchical complexity, yep. Habermas, and of course, Piaget, which is where this whole thing was going, which is that, no, there's a nested system of justifications, each of which is valid, <laughs> and yet each of which gets increasingly valid, right? Which is what's so interesting is that four-year-olds are not dumb at all. Four-year-olds are actually way smarter than we think they are. Right now, in some specific areas, they're obviously not as advanced as a 16 year old, but they're doing a lot. And there's horizontal spread at developmental levels, which gets lost when you go vertical, which is to say there's stuff four year olds know that we do not know. Yep. Because <laughs> we're not down there at the, at the mm -hmm. four year old level, doing four year old things, building that rich knowledge and sensory motor representations and things. So, but there is this vector of normativity. Um, uh, and power and a, and a few other things, aspects of psychological power, meaning like just the ability to focus attention and things. Um, so, Greg. I, 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 I I'm spoke. sorry, John. That's okay. I mean, this is ultimately, and I don't mean reductively, but this is ultimately a, a view of education that goes back to Plato. Because when you start moving into, I, I, it's not just that I know more, but I know better, then you're invoking wisdom as something distinct uh, from knowledge because you're bringing in this normative evaluation. And, and, and then I assume, given what you're saying, that the, the, the way you justify the better, uh, the way you do it in Plato is the 16 year old's model of causality is better than the four year old's because it's somehow, and I'm gonna put this in scare quotes because we need to talk about it, it's somehow truer. It somehow gets at a deeper, it's a deeper account it's more in touch with the reality of causation than the four-year-old. And, 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 so, and so I hear a lot of Plato and even the, hierarch or the hierarchical complexity yes. is a very Neoplatonic uh, way of trying to understand how we move up the ladder of intelligibility. I'm hearing all of that also in what you're saying. Uh, uh, is that a way in which, um, is that one way, no, I'm not trying to be exclusive, but is that one way in which, you know, the philosophical discussions about education can connect to what we're doing here? Yes. Yeah, no, precisely. I mean, the source text is probably the Mino. Yes. Right? 
like yeah. the yeah. because yeah. the 16 year old's understanding of causality is is better than the four-year-old's but it is also implicit within the four-year-olds which is to say that under normal conditions the four-year-old will get there there's not an exclusivity and this is an important dimension of teacherly authority which is that i know better than you ha 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 is not teacherly authority <laughs> or i know better than you and i will control you right that's propaganda uh, education is i know better than you and will bring you up <laughs> It leads you right pedagogy leads you down the path yeah. to the be in the position that i am that i'm in um and so the mino is that great one where he gets the slave boy to draw yeah. in the dirt and basically gets out of him complex geometrical theorems from a kid who mm -hmm. has never even heard of geometry um just showing that built into the structure of experience and relationship is enough to to move people through these what PJ would call these natural stages of deepening into reality. That's what that's, you know, and PJ, yep. he talked to like that. It was like the subject deepens. <laughs> and as the subject deepens, reality expands simultaneously. So you get this like um, you know, deepening in touchness with reality. And it's complex because it seems like you're becoming more abstract and complex. Exactly. And in some ways you are. <laughs> in some ways you're becoming more abstract and complex, but you're also becoming more, of a container for more of reality and seeing yep. more interconnections between more things. And, and importantly too, and this is again, a neglected aspect of Piaget, you're feeling more, you know, Piaget believed that cognition and emotion were two sides of the same coin. One good work, which was translated called the grasp of consciousness was basically to this point, you know, very much like a relevance realization notion that consciousness, yeah, yeah, yes. I, I, consciousness is an active yeah, yeah. process and evaluative process. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. So, so there's, there's uh, many rich threads into it. Yeah. Greg. Well, I'll just say then, you know, I'll bring the Aristotle view. Uh, my friend Blaine Fowers, you know, t is a scholar in this area. He talks about the evolution of functional forms and the way in which Aristotle thinks about the mm -hmm. proper entity, a knife is good because it's sharp and it cuts. And we should be thinking about functional forms in a particular way. And we can generate ideas about the functional form of humanity and utilize that, say, on the eudiamonic continuum about, well, how do social animals get together and produce a eudiamonic state, a wise state of being? That becomes a particular functional form, which you can then use to reference. Uh, and he argues that creates, uh, Blaine Fowers argues, that creates a lot of is-ought complexity um, in perhaps a very sophisticated way that we can upgrade that the modern enlightenment sort of with its rejection of Aristotle's metaphysics, I think perhaps, you know, extreme rejection of its metaphysics in relationship to final formal causation, things along those lines. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to make one more point on that, the history, because the work of Mark Taylor and others, right? So mod mod modernism is not only rejecting Aristotle, right, which it is, it's also rejecting Renaissance Neoplatonic magical theory, right? Because in Plotinus, you get the synthesis of Aristotle and Plato, and you get this idea that cognition is always, is always fitting itself to the object of cognition. And the deeper the, deeper the reality, it's trying to, it, it has to transform itself. So there's an, for in Plotinus, it is, a, it is a thoroughly inherently transformational epistemology. Mm -hmm. There is no way that the mind can relate to a deeper reality unless it has undergone a fundamental transformation. But the problem is the Neoplatonic magicians and philosophers, are they're trying to talk about self-organization. They didn't think that matter was inert. Think of inertia. They didn't think matter was inert. They believed in action at a distance, right? And all kinds of spooky stuff. And, and, the, and, the, and, and, and so I just wanted to make, I just wanted to bring back that um, there's an important way in which uh, I, 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 I hear Zach saying, you know, that there's this, there's this process of scaffolding cognition via, which is, right, a scaffolding of intelligibility, which is also a scaffolding of reality. I, is that a fair way of understanding this? Totally. Yeah, I mean, it is a hierarchy of knowing and being, right? Yes. Uh, that's exactly. beautiful. Exactly. Exactly. A, a, a co-evolving hierarchy of knowing and being. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Love it. Exactly. Thomas is exactly. How I spent 
uh, a lot of time studying Plotinus for, for this reason, you know, that's right. not a coincidence like Ken Wilbur loves Plotinus and, you know, there's uh, James Hillman, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a reason to look at the Neoplatonists yeah. as the first psychologists maybe or something like yes. that. Yes. And, and so that notion of, yes, the rejection of Aristotelian thought by modernity um, and uh, also the rejection of the Neoplatonist chain of being yeah, uh, yeah. by modernity. Um, both of those things were things that Piaget really wasn't willing to throw away and was trying to find a way to somehow <laughs> preserve in the context of, of modernity specifically. Um, right. uh, he, as a, as a youth, uh, wrote an autobiography as a kid, which is hilarious, but it was an autobiographical novel where he struggled with the problem of science and religion. And he identified this notion of an evolving Aristotelian science of forms uh, as a way of resolving the crisis between science and, and religion. So he was always kind of working secretly as a Neoplatonist mystic trying yeah, to yeah, yeah. You know, like preserve. That's so like, cool. That is, is cool. So cool. Like he says that, that. So like he cool. says that <laughs> like in, in Chapman's book, the great book, uh, Constructive Evolution, probably the best book on Piaget, um, Chapman. Uh, he, there's all these quotes from Piaget where he says as much. He's like, when I'm studying the child coming to know more and coming therefore into more being, he's studying kind of the evolution of God and that kind of, neoplatonic way there's there's that synthesis of kind of evolutionary thought in neoplatonism where you just take the platonic stack and you just knock it on its side and unfold yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right. and so piaget was very much plugged into that discourse reading bergson and when right. you read when you read biology and knowledge which i think is maybe piaget's most interesting book it's very hard to say that though it's a very, I mean, it's a scope of like Atelier de Chardin or something. It's a sweeping mm -hmm. scope that's including human and specifically human science, human knowing, human ethics, human normativity in an understanding of the universe as a whole, that right. it didn't just kind of parachute out of nowhere in this meaningless causal void. And now all of a sudden we create value out of nowhere. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, no, 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 value runs deep way back. And the hierarchy of knowing and being runs deep yes. like there was knowing and being before there were humans right um and that was very important to piaget like he was studying he had a little till the end till he was very old experimenting with succulent plants and mollusks to try to like get evolutionary behavior to take place in closed environments and so he was he was very much interested in the problem philosophically even more than psychologically like he was really finding he was looking for those threads that are metaphysically cutting through all of those strata and just like he wanted to be in touch with mm. yeah <laughs> the mind of god or something like that uh yep. remarkable um so hmm. so so is that <clears throat> like you you've talked about structural isomorphisms is is that and i and i'm sort of Trying to prod you to also to talk about hierarchical complexity and maybe uh, maybe talk about it in terms of complexification as well. But is that is that you know Evan Thompson talks about it as the deep continuity, um, but I think it is ultimately goes back to uh, a Neoplatonic sort of framework. Is that is that right? Is that the basis for the like for the uh, what's the term you use the ethnocentrism? of overcoming the ethnocentrism of the disciplines to try mm -hmm. and get that sort of, if you'll allow me, neoplatonic framework in place, brought up to modern speed with dynamical system theory, et cetera. It, I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying not to commit the sin of oversimplification, but I'm trying to make a connection. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's <clears throat> that's the direction we're, we're heading in, you know, yeah. that there are these certain patterns, hierarchical complexity being one, right. nonlinear dynamics of yeah. growth being another, um, self-organizing, yeah, self-transcending, yeah. tra self-transforming yeah. systems being a third. And these are things Piaget was identifying in the 70s. Yes. You know, yes. Um, as possible common languages across these disciplines that are relevant to the, for him, the human sciences. Um, but relevant, I would think, to other interdisciplinary work as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when you're looking at um, the way patterns of human growth look like the patterns of growth in biological organisms mm -hmm. you get for example those non-linear yeah. growth mm -hmm. so that when we all know the growth spurt which is a physiological sure. 
example, where like in a couple of days, this kid grows inches and it like literally hurts. Uh, you know, Kurt Fisher, uh, the great Neo PhD, and he demonstrated that through behavioral data that kids will do this for a long time. And then relatively in a short time, be like, boom, drop up to a new level. Like they'll be not using any first person pronouns. And then they'll realize what a first person pronoun is. And now they're using it constantly. And that happens in like, like a matter of a day or two days. Mm -hmm. That was uh, where the great people who applied dynamical systems theory to human development. Oh, yeah. Paul Van Geert. Uh, this was Van Geert's dissertation. Mm -hmm. He just looked at his own kid in terms of pronoun uses and saw all of these nonlinear spurts. Um, and when you look at other types of biological phenomena, especially in very complex systems, you see similar perturbations and jumps, jumps and drops and jumps and drops and then stabilizations, right? Those kinds of patterns of dynamical variability in complex systems uh, was what Kurt was studying and was where the neo piagetian approach ended up going, looking at patterns of variability uh, in growth, um, as opposed to what Piaget did was look at patterns of stability. That's why you got stereotypes. It's just like, oh, there are these four universal stages, which is actually not correct. <clears throat> if you read Piaget, in each one of his books, he lays out a different set of stages. And sometimes there's many, many detailed substages. <laughs> uh, so the gross textbook characterization is not generally true when you go to the original source texts. Um, like the way and, Maslow has been reduced to the, hi the hierarchy. Yeah, very much so, very much so. And What's interesting too, is that he would get into what we ended up calling Electica learning sequences, where you, you, you don't just lay out the like four stages and be like, it's great, you wanna get to the top. You, like, you, you look at how the argument actually progressed. Like, oh, actually, if you think that way mm -hmm. about the primacy of life over laws, the classic Kohlbergen example, like mm -hmm. you always follow the law, no matter what, even if it costs you your life, right? If you, if you really think that, you follow that, you'll hit these cases at the edge, mm -hmm. <laughs> which force you, but what if the law is unjust? Oh, whoa. And then you have to flip back. And then, so he's tracing out the actual kind of learning logic, if you yep. will, logic of the learning progression. Um, he's doing that in his work on moral development. So instead of just being these inexplicable magical stages, <laughs> which people like you blow out the candles on your 12th birthday and you're a formal operator, it, it's in fact, he sees through, again, field work, detailed field work, basically, <laughs> as a biologist, just talking to kids and the, the pathways through and up. Uh, and so that gets us back to this heart of this issue, hierarchical complexity, right. this nested system of justifications within adult development, and all of these various learning sequences through that state, sp state space of possible justifications, which expands as you get increasingly complex. Um, right. And so that puts us in a, a, a really interesting situation theoretically basically this is where pj kind of left us <laughs> which is like okay if we understand that there are these patterns that apply across nonlinear patterns jumping patterns self-organizing patterns right those apply somehow in the domain of the normative somehow mm -hmm. in the domain of justification systems um mm -hmm. but how right what is the nature of for example major shifts in cultural zeitgeists of value or major shifts in personal zeitgeist concerning mm -hmm. value. Like how do those work specifically? Uh, and so there's a, there are certain tools that Piaget gives us to help us think about that, which the Neo-Piagetians tried to, to tinker with and I, which I tried to tinker with when I, when I got in there. Um, mm -hmm. And some of it requires separating uh, those things which are clearly isomorphic from those things which are emergent and normative. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, when you're looking at uh, someone's arguments, um, you know, you want to be able to identify the, the complexity, right, of the argument, which is like an objective measure. This is what we do at Lectica. We objectively measure hierarchical complexity of verbal performance or written performance. Um, but that's a separate question from how good is that argument? And I think this is where the developmental literature got very confused after Kohlberg. They conflated these. Um, you end up seeing that the power that comes with increasing complexity and in cognition um, doesn't necessarily correlate with uh, increasing uh, absence of mistakes, <laughs> right? Or increasing absence of bias. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
you end up with a more nuanced view of development than the simple developmentalists would give us, which is a simple mm-hmm. growth to goodness model. Piaget falls into this trap quite often mm-hmm. as well. Um, one reason I think Piaget falls in the trap is because he mostly studied children and he mostly said the development of necessary knowledge, which was like basically hard to avoid if you were growing up as a human. But in adult development, uh, you're basically in a, um, you step into the simulation of education and culture and language and things become much more, much more complex. Right. In terms of- I, I, I think it'd be good just to pause or double click on growth to goodness, because that really does capture a lot of the dilemma. The intuition basically being, hey, well, as you climb up, that's better, that's more power, and that's more sophistication. Um, But the line of what is better at the level of, say, competent sophistication, the line that is um, wise, the line that affords, you know, the most growth towards eudaimonia, that's, those are not necessarily the same line. So I just want to say that for people that um, might have, I think that's a beautiful phrase that's used fairly regularly. And for listeners, I just wanted to make sure we sort of catch that because it's a beautiful way of capturing the dilemma or the presuppositions that need to be teased apart. I'd like to uh, pick up on that too. And I, I talk about it in a different way, but in a way that I think is convergent, especially around ideas of wisdom. You want complexification to be coupled to the complexity of reality. Right, so right, you, there are many ways in which a system can complexify. I talk about parasitic processing that disconnect us radically from, and they, and they can build, be built out of completely adaptive machinery. And yet that, 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 that self-organizing complexification that's built out of you know, adaptive machinery can nevertheless massively right, disconnect us from reality and I imagine Greg, you hit this all the time in therapy. People often have these very complex ways in which they are maladaptively disconnected. And so yes. if you, and, that, and I, that's, that's why I fundamentally agree with what you're saying, Zach, you can't take simple complexification as a measure of, right, normal, uh, I guess I'll call it normative improvement. But the standard I'm using here um, is, right, something like, well, how, how it's the Neoplatonic. How, are you disclosing... Is this complexity actually reliably helping, uh, affording you to disclose real patterns in the world? That's what I take to be um, something that's missing if you just measure the complexity in, by its sort of, uh, a pure sort of mathematical uh, metric. Is that, I, I, it feels absolutely. like that convergence. That's, like, that's, that's, break. Does that line yeah, up with what? No, that's, no, absolutely. I just, I just wanted us to be, clear that sophistication and goodness in various can be mm-hmm. <laughs> differentiated. And Plato made that famous, yeah. the sophists, right, were mm-hmm. the target of it, right, because he uh, disagreed with their educational program. Let's remember that they were teachers precisely because being sophisticated in even the etymological origin of the mm-hmm. word is mm-hmm. not the same thing as becoming wise. Right. And that's basically what we're talking about. And so there's a few nuances here which are important. So Developmentally, again, the way the reason that Piaget didn't resolve the growth goodness problem, uh, the reason is that when you are developing sensory motor systems and getting proficiency with understanding how gravity works and how your body relates to space and how time and all these things, these things like, uh, there's a certain amount of hopefully, barring crazy bad upbringings, just reliable differential responsiveness of the environment to the child that's extremely predictable, basically across cultures like most kids know that if you throw something they can predict where it will go right in almost all cultures and things of that nature and even when you get up into early language use in you know, what Kerr called representational tier we can do a lot of complex language processing but you're not doing a lot of abstract thinking so you're tied to the specifics of your immediate environment and what your family can tell you in stories and things of that nature there's also only so much complexity uh, that can accrue, which is uh, out of touch with reality, mm-hmm. right? But as soon as you get up into abstraction, which can begin as early as 10 uh, or earlier, like we don't, it's, the point is not exactly when, the point is that there is an onset, <laughs> there's a before and an after. Uh, when you get abstraction, then you enter something that's much more like a socially constructed simulation of reality 
Uh, and that's where you get all the forms of, that's where you get the emergence of superego and the, the forms of abstract internalization of social code and a whole bunch of other stuff sets on with abstraction, which is again, I think unique to humans. <laughs> uh, that level of socialization that can be cloistered from reality. Um, and so what well, that generates is- a propositional system that knows that at a level of symbolic abstraction that's radically removed from our participating, you know, perspectival yep. modes of being in the world. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that, and so that's where you end up having to say, yeah, just because someone's becoming more complex and they're actually learning more about specific stuff and they're able to make complex arguments, um, you know, the Darth Vader move is always possible, right? <laughs> uh, which is that you can get really abstract and complex really f- strong cognitively uh, and sometimes emotionally, uh, but um, making errors, making very, very profound errors um, yep. of various kinds. And I, 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 I'll say even the, the Borg move is even to me more sort of what science does, you know, in terms of Star Trek's next generation, right? They basically turn it into an algorithmic machine. I mean, rather than evil per se, but it just, it factors out everything that's subjectively, oh, well, whatever. And now I will just, do, I will just turn it into an algorithmic machine. Yeah. That to me is, those are, those are two, hey, get power and control the shit out of stuff for selfish interests, be blind to shit, and just go algorithmic reductive at a particular type of meta- metabolic danger. At least I would see that clinically sometimes. <laughs> There's uh I had something recently uh, that, that really made brought this home to me. Um, I'm reading Spinoza, and then right in Spinoza is the ultra rational logician, and uh, you know, there's lots of his. He's also all, all deeply mystical, influenced probably through Kabbalah about the Neoplatonic tradition. But he basically said, he's so I think it's in one of his letters. He said, "You need to understand, God doesn't have abstract ideas." And and I and I think. So yeah, we go through abstraction to try and get up to this, but mm-hmm. we have to remember that that's not right. That doesn't actually, that's not what God is, right? God, God is right. Somehow we go all the way up, like, but, but it also comes all the way back down and meet like God, right? Do you see what I'm trying to convey yes, with that? Totally. Right. right. Yes. I mean, that's a, that's a wisdom energy for me at that level yes. is totally up and down, you know, simultaneously. Yeah. And when, I got, when I got that, I got, you know, I'd already got some understanding of Scantia Intuitiva, but when I got that, I got, oh, when I get like that, where I do all this propositional abstraction and then it drops, and that's your language, right? When it drops into the perspectival and the participatory, right, transformational coupled immediacy, that's actually Scantia Actually, I think that's your language, John. <laughs> <laughs> hey, actually, we now have language together. Who would have thunk it? It's like we're building a metapsychology. That's very interesting. And then, of course, the, the Neoplatonic... And the Taoists are called the, the macrocosmic orbit, right? Yes, like yes, very the much. circulation up and down the yeah. great chain of being uh, and the individual being a microcosm of the great chain of being also needing to run that circulatory process. Yes, and yes. this is what's sometimes pointed out, like Kurt was always very interested in all of this talk about the higher stages. He thought it was foolish. Like he thought mm-hmm. that basically um, wisdom has a lot to do with graceful degradation which is one of the ways to think about it and actually different forms of consolidation that come precisely from the exhaustion of (laughs) uh, abstraction and complexity as a solution. And this gets into the broader meta psychology, which is all of I've been talking about is development. (laughs) There's also what I call insolment and transcendence, right? And both of those also have transformative processes in them, Mm -hmm. which look like developmental processes, but aren't they're they're different. Um, Mm -hmm. So like the way a, kid goes from being in the crib and not speaking to be able to solve math problems Mm -hmm. is different but related to how the kid in the crib goes from not being able to fall in in love and give of himself to others to be able to basically give of himself to others for uh you know basically soul (laughs) <laughs> reasons, spirit reasons. Uh, and then transcendence, again, the kid who has no awareness of self, no ability to control his attention, no ability to relate to living symbols of immortality, as I refer to it, turns into someone who can do that. Mm. Uh, different from cognitive development and different from insolment, 
which is like personality or character development mm -hmm. is the development of capacities in the domain of transcendence. Um, mm. Well, we definitely want to talk about that, but I wanted to go back because I think we be paused because you were in the middle of an argument. Mm -hmm. You're saying, look, development has this pretty tight coupling and error is quite diagnostic through all these levels. That's what I heard you saying. And then you move into this other domain where abstraction becomes possible, but it's also, it, it's like, I mean, I'm thinking about this inbounded rationality, right? It's also, it, uncertainty becomes much more an issue. Complexity becomes an issue. And from the problem solving literature, ill-definedness becomes an issue. And you see Plato wrestling with all these. When I'm asking what a virtue is, when I'm asking, you know, what's right. honesty, like this is an ill-defined problem. There's, there's always uncertainty, right? There's tremendous complexity. And, and so I'm wrestling with, uh, a, 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 a much sloppier, right, if you'll allow me that metaphor through the state space feedback uh -huh. loop that, that I uh -huh. don't have when I'm trying to figure out how to throw the rock or I'm trying to figure out the syntax so that mom and dad will understand me. Is that a fair way of like- mm -hmm. uh, Right, and especially, especially in a modern or postmodern culture. Right. right. Well, there are some, can you build on that point, please? Well, yeah, there are some, so there are some cultural contexts and there's a whole spiel about Margaret Mead's notions of cultural evolution, but there are cultural contexts, which are usually called prefigurative, mm -hmm. where the environment of socialization is so predictable from generation to generation and the requirements of life change so little that when you move up into the abstract realm, it's just very clear. Yeah. There's no, the norming of the way you think about the world is controlled. And that level of norming is always what, like the worst <laughs> modern politi political theorists have tried to recreate <laughs> when there's actually another way to stabilize personality that you can in open societies. So does, so, does that map onto in any way, like Durkheim's mechanical solidarity versus, you know, the complex solidarity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the division of labor, because it's, I mean, one of Durkheim's point is social coalescence is very easy, uh, right? Within mechanical solidarity, it's much more challenging when you have the division of labor in society, mm -hmm. right? You have complex, you have a complex or, so the system is held together by complex interdependence rather than me mechanical solidarity. I was just wondering if, if there's, if there's. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the distinction well enough to speak to it. Cause like, I would understand the kind of culture I was imagining was almost like an indigenous culture or a, a culture or like a medieval village or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would very where, much. What kind like of, a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and so what you get is cultural evolution coinciding with educational systems, basically putting individuals in unprecedentedly complex situations of justification. Yeah. Um, like uh, not only were you on the option of deciding which justification system to adopt as an identity structure, we're in the situation of being able to claim that one does not adopt a justification system. <laughs> uh, and so it's a, there's a deep uh, added confusion to this in current conditions as part of the educational crisis right, and the crisis right, of right, teacherly right. authority. Um, one yeah, way to fit. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say one way that I would think about it. So the oral indigenous, you are face-to-face -face embedded like you are in a family. So you have, there's the whole history of actual, real interactions with rich traditions that are completely woven in where the scope of awareness is, you know, pretty much what you have actual contact with. And then to build the systems of justification that are required in the transition into civilized societies where you have thousands of people that live in a city that then need to be regulated by rules, industry, there's a techno-social economic environment that you have to op oblige for. So you, then that system of in, requires a level of abstraction and, and formalization in relationship that is qual puts on in terms of the psychotechnologies that are required for that is a radical shift in, in relationship to what, you know, is required to, for everyday living. Yeah. yeah no, I, I think that would map onto what I'm saying too. That, that's you, yeah. what you're getting is when you have to live with lots of strangers who have roles different than yours, and you have fundamentally no expertise or knowledge in their roles, you become dependent on them in a different way than you do within an indigenous community where people are generally, they, they do multiple roles, they're much more similar to each other. I'm not trying to be reductionistic, but the point is, mm 
Like it's easy. Actually, John, your whole point about the way we identify, identify self, identify basically the societal socialization at that level then creates this whole matrix, right? Of identification of role that is not personal, but is abstract in a particular way. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I was, I'm thinking of it in terms of sort of George Herbert Mead, the idea mm -hmm. that it's, it, it's easier to sort of data compress a generalized other from a society that's mechanically complex really? than it is for one in which you have all this, right? Yeah. You, you no, that's exactly right. And that was just, I was like a parenthetical to your point, but in general, your point's correct, that there are the lower levels of development, the feedback loops for learning are direct from the environment, yeah. barring, you know, abuse or something like that. When yeah. you get into abstraction, then you get a whole bunch of other things happening where you can continue down certain abstract routes that are erroneous or without value yeah. or yeah. unethical yeah. potentially. And so another, but there's one moment where the growth to goodness uh, model is actually correct. And so if you can identify the task demands required to make certain decisions, like, so for example, if you know that to think well about that problem, you need to be able to do at least abstract systems, which means multiple abstractions related in nonlinear relationships, right? Hmm. That's how complex that problem is, which is like most of the problems people need to solve. In fact, many of them now are way beyond that. And this is to my point. And you look at the people trying to solve those problems and you never see evidence that they're able to do that level of complexity. Yeah. yeah. Then you can basically, they're disqualified now those people mm. who can do that level of complexity right doesn't right. mean they're going to be able to solve that problem but at least they have <laughs> it's a necessary it's at a least necessary. they have the capacity to solve that problem uh and so that's where you do get uh, a growth to goodness something built in and also an ability to use this form of thinking about development to to think about solving problems in our society because mm. i think right now we're in a situation where the problems that we're attempting to solve are demonstrably more complex yep. than the capacities of those people attempting to solve them and i think we've seen that in the past couple of years like mm. grossly in evidence um yep. uh and so there's a there's a way that that's like a stark reality so by saying you know it's not growth to goodness we haven't diffused that problem which is the problem of competence in yep. the face of sheer complexity and needing to be very realistic about how complex a problem is and how complex our capacities are to meet it, not pretending we can put ourselves right. in a position to be able to. And so that's, that's mostly what we're seeing. That's why politicians, right. mm -hmm. politicians need to wake up and mm -hmm. exit the stage and allow actual leaders who are complex enough to solve the problems that they're attempting to solve. Because what they do is they downward assimilate the problem to a simpler problem. Which yeah, is yeah. Problem of getting, which is the problem of getting reelected. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not the right fucking problem to solve. And so that, you know, the global mm. problems of existential risk, for example, mm -hmm. um, right so now, it's true. That, that makes me think of Morton's argument in hyper objects, right? Mm -hmm. that we're now in the age of, like there's always been hyper objects, but we're now in the age of oppressive threatening, right? Hyper objects like global warming, right? Um, just to use his, his example, right? Now that, that brings up a question and I, I might be guilty of this. So, right, you obviously know Piaget deeply, but one of the standard criticisms of him and how he differs from like Vygotsky is Piaget tends to concentrate on the individual mind world relationship and not as much on collective intelligence. Here's why I bring that up. Here's the connecting idea. Uh, it's an idea that Dan Chappie and I are exploring that what humans typically do to deal with things that get that hyper object complexity is they not only develop themselves, but they create, you know, distributed cognition that has a collective intelligence that is powerful enough and it's self distributed enough that it can do the kind of work that is needed. This is, this is people all over the world taking right. measurements for global warming. Right, and then coordinating that with co computational machinery and all kinds of stuff in order to be able to track this hyper object that no individual, no matter what their development would be, would give, would give them access to. Now, no, that's precisely correct. You know, one of the main capacities missing in leadership circles is collaborative capacity, right? <laughs> which right. is a cognitive capacity for perspective taking and an emotional capacity. Um, right, right. Uh, right. So that, that's grossly absent. And yeah, no, that is, again, one of the things people are taught about PJ, which is just simply incorrect. And in, in okay. part, it's an error of mistrans. It's like just not enough translated. Right. Les Smith, a great PJ scholar, translated some of the most important work there. Um, I think it's called studies and reasoning. And there you see that Piaget understands reasoning ultimately as a collaborative activity. Mm -hmm. that 
uh, one does not reason alone. And when one is sitting alone, you've internalized your communication community. It's very George Herbert Mead way of thinking. That's media, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. That there's a he actually identified isomorphisms of like social logic with philosophical logic that right. he, he, I, it, again i'd have to revisit these texts but it was almost like he was arguing that logic emerged out of our making explicit what is implicit in the social field of human relationship that's somewhat it's similar like justification to hypothesis it's also <laughs> similar to habermas in some important yes way. it's very similar to habermas yeah so and it's also similar in some ways to the work that uh, sperber and mercier are doing right now mm. uh, the enigma reason about reason is ultimately it works best dialogically rather than monologically. So could I just ask you to say the name of that book by Piaget that that, that does that? Uh, I believe it was called Studies in Reasoning, but the uh, the translator is Les Smith. Okay. So if you look for Les Smith, you'll you'll find that I um, I haven't been in touch with him, but I knew him back in the Jean Piaget days. Um, because I, I I mean I, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to read that book. That book is very relevant for the whole dialectic into the Logos project uh, yeah. I'm working on right now. Yeah, for Piaget, the normative was very, very social. It was very, very social. And the Piaget Vygotsky like feud was um, was uh, inflated. It was it was yeah. interesting because it generated a lot of I think important ideas. But had Piaget been more uh, comprehensively handled, um, I don't think it would have emerged. I think. Mm. Uh, yeah, so this question, I'd like to return to this question of you get this stack of justification systems and there's all these different routes through it. And some of those routes through it are better and worse and different positions in that yield teacherly authority or not. Mm. Um, and so this question of transformation as being related to questions of teacherly authority mm -hmm. is where I ended up kind of with this, all of the work was kind of directed towards that at the end of the mm. day, which was mm -hmm. how can we theorize teacherly authority in a way that's interdisciplinary um, and in a way that allows us to kind of like reconfigure the social field to assure for ongoing collective learning, you know, because no one, no one can solve the problem alone, John. <laughs> like yeah. literally the main thing we need is, is unprecedented collaborative capacities um, uh, in order to solve these really complex problems. And, and can I connect that to another one of your ideas? Because now I see them connected in a way I hadn't before, right? Because the, the collaboration is not only synchronic, it's diachronic across generations. Yes. And, and so one of, the, one of the ways distributed cognition complexifies and attempts to couple to the complexity of the world is the cultural ratcheting effect, right? And, and that intergenerational responsibility. Uh, and so, right, it, it, so I, I'm, I'm now seeing a connection between what you talk about in teacherly authority and the idea that the collaboration is also intergenerational, not just synchronic in nature. Precisely. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And the cultural ratcheting effect is like, that's, that's really the way I, I model that usually coming from yeah. Tomasello, where you see how critical those fulcrums are in the transformation of, of culture and yeah. the nature of those where there's a normative moment where you inherit from the past and yet make novel for the future, right? right. That, and we talked about this in previous conversations. It's like, okay, am I still Zach, even yeah. though I've been through all that shit? Because yeah. it's like, I am, right? So there's continuity, which I come from the yeah. past and yet I'm not, I've changed in a way that prepares me for the future. And so that ratcheting effect in cultural evolution is similar to that the basis okay. of transformation is this like social nexus of evaluation. It's like this, um, yeah, there's a, there's a task that takes place, something like there's a choice, um, which is made. Uh, which through. means that the, the, we have this to use Vygotsky, then the zone of proximal development of handing off across time and across above in proper relationship to maintain the continued evolvability. Yeah. And then if we're like, oh, shit, teacherly authority is breaking down, institutions are breaking down, the digital world changing all reality very quickly, and you don't have to sort of put too many more variables into the mix to be like, fuck, this is a big real world problem. It's a big real world problem. And 
like it's getting so bad too because of the digital overlay that even some of the lower levels that we discussed which seem to be not a problem exactly, exactly. are becoming a problem now yes so, the digital so, the, yeah. the 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 imposition or uh, uh, the replacement of the physical world with the virtual world is undermining the reliability of even the more basic levels that's sure. yeah that is fundamentally i think important and i think not enough attention we're running this grand experiment with these devices on our children and we don't know what it's going to do although we're starting to we already know it's making them much more depressed much more anxious that some of their social skills are being being truncated in important ways some of the data for that's already coming but i expect we're going to find much more uh, cognitive uh, alterations that are not yet apparent to us and in um, adults adults too yes. <laughs> i mean like i think it's affecting adult development um, profoundly as well. And it's precisely with that digital overlay. Like there's that French theorist, uh, Baudrillard, right? Who had the theory of simulation and it was ultimately a theory of civilizational collapse because <laughs> it basically said like civilizations create information and they control behavior through that information. And then eventually they create a simulation that is so convincing that the reality dependence of our ideas become irrelevant because all we have to do is relate to the simulation wow. of the society and we succeed really? in the society. Um, so, as, but as soon as societies get thrown into a state where the simulation is, is mm. broken and you're confronted with actual reality again, like this is what, this is the problem. And so like pandemics are an interesting example of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like you can create as much simulation as you want, but at the end of the day, it, people are still dying. Hard. It's yeah. well, or, or not, right? Yeah, so sure. it's like, it's happening. Something's happening. Uh, and so that's, I think, where we are at a crossroads with our relationship to reality as a culture. So, so that brings up then like a, a sort of another dimension of this problem we're wrestling with. And maybe we can sort of wrap up with this and then it, it will also, I hope, platform us for the next discussion, mm -hmm. which is, so I want to go into the ensoulment and spirit dimension. Yep. Uh, and I know Greg does too, but here's the, here's the problem. And here's what I think it leads into that. So there's a way in which you can see religion as doing imaginal augmentate, uh, imaginally augmented reality that nevertheless has the opposite effect rather than disconnecting you from reality when it's working. So we'll, we'll talk about the best religion, right? Not the worst, right? Right. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually getting people like Neo, Neo, Neoplatonic Christianity, for example, it's doing that thing where it's, you know, it's got this imaginally augmented, like the great chain of being. There's an, there's an image. It's not in here. It's right. It's imaginal and it's augmenting like, you know, virtual augmentation, like Pokemon Go. It's augmenting reality so that you can see patterns that you could not otherwise not see or hold in mind. Mm -hmm. How is that fundamentally different from Baudrillard's problem? of the simulation that becomes so convincing that it cuts us off from reality. And I think the answer to that question has to be woven into when we're, think, when we're talking about ensoulment and transcendence in some fashion. Very, very nice. good question. Because <clears throat> of course, Baudrillard is the cynical French person would say there's no difference your religion's a complete simulation as well. And those are the guys who invented it. Come on, man. Uh, you know, Christianity is the greatest psyop ever. Um, but I think he'd be wrong. Like the, the main place where Baudrillard makes mistakes is actually in his psychological modeling. He under theorizes the individuals who are exposed to the simulation. Because the other thing that happens, and this is where we kind of have a built in corrective measure at the higher levels, you move through these levels of abstraction. If you're lucky enough to get beyond certain points of abstraction, you get certain capacities for self reflection. Yes. Which, allow, which allow you to have a conversation like this where you're like, dude, we're like in a simulation or something because <laughs> this news story doesn't fit with reality and there's a disconnect. And so like, what are we, you know? So that level of reflectivity is one of the human psychological limits on the extent to which a simulation can work. Now, if the simulation puts a ceiling on people's capacity, yes, yes that's what I was gonna say. then you can actually have that self-terminating through overwhelming simulation and reality disconnect civilizational collapse scenario, right? Like that happens. But if you have an open enough society where enough people pop out <laughs> and want to get in touch with reality again, not by going backwards into the sensory motor, 
but by going mm-hmm. up and out and into, which is also, by the way, why people crave the sensory motor in deep simulation because they're like, mm-hmm. give me reality. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't care if I have to go like in a sweat lodge or do what I need to feel some reality, but you can also pop out through and start to reflect back on. Um, and so what that means is that there is uh, a way to, you know, reality test simulations. And from a developmental perspective, then you get that notion of like this conveyor belt and teacherly authority works with that dynamic, which is that, listen, when you're at this age, I explain it like this, Mm -hmm. right? You're not going to like that explanation when you get older. I mean, you'll, you'll understand why I gave it to you, but you need a complex one. You're deepening. Now you can argue that those lower levels are like lies and they're part of a simulation that you're creating around the kid to make him feel happy and not depressed or something. But if they're attached through the learning logic to yes. increasingly adequate views, <laughs> which are increasingly you know, tested, et cetera, then you get this, this conveyor belt notion of moving up into increasingly adequate conceptions, right. which each, each one is a simulation while you're in it because it's not completely true, but you're not deepening into deeper simulation. You're getting out now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is me being super fast and loose with Baudrillard and stuff. <laughs> But I think, I think we're in, I think we're, it's safe. I think what we're doing is, is pretty, is pretty safe to speculate on. Now, there's always this problem with these kinds of arguments, um, uh, which is that it's very hard to know, like back, for example, in the, during the 30 years war, like a lot of the 30 years war looks to me like a Baudrillardian problem. Yeah, yeah. Like it was precisely that they had, they were simulating hell. And like my version mm-hmm. of hell is way scarier than your version of hell. And you better yeah. convert or you go to a hell that's like this. And so that sense of like weaponizing simulated information warfare, this is what you get in those days. So I think we have to be very careful. We're saying, no, it's this kind of religion <laughs> under these conditions. No, no, I, w- I, w- I was doing that. I, yeah. I, yeah, I really, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to talk about the relationship between reflection and religio and how th- those are brought together in the notion of wisdom. In, yes. in the mm. that's exactly. what that's what i wanted mm. Beautiful. and i and i wanted to set that up as sort of a bit of a a, a problem a, a platform problem that would allow us and, and, and maybe you can take it with the lead again next time zach on okay. the, the, the t- topics of ensoulment yep. and spirit and transcendence but maybe uh, you know it'll be I, I suspect that one will be much more dialogical when we when we mm. move to those topics how does yeah. that sound for going forward that sounds good yeah yeah, no, that sounds perfect for me. Nice bridge. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to sort of point to help close. I always like to give both of you a chance if there's any final brief summative or cumulative thing you want to say uh, before we bring the session as a whole to a close. Well, I mean, for me, I'll say, I mean, just reliving this history through Piaget, the sophisticated developmentalists, I, I've certainly looked into this, but it's um, it only just reaffirms the need for an adequate framework of is and ought that's actually up to the task. Uh, And of course we need that for education in general, but we need it for an education at a time between worlds where we are seeing massive amounts of, well, uh, deep concern about collapse with good justification. Um, So to me, the issue is shit. There really (laughs) There really is an angle on this that does afford us a good conformal grip on the evolution of complexification over time. Uh, We can get much more specific about it. If we had that architecture, we could build a lot more interdisciplinarity. We can then build the necessary collective intelligence uh, conversations to afford us an understanding of the hyper objects uh, and then get rightly oriented in toward wisdom uh, for us. And and so I I just feel that very passionately. And I felt that in this conversation deeply get anchored today. Yeah, this is great. It felt really good to let my Piagetian hair down, kind of just <laughs> put it out. And but again, this is a third of the a, th- a third of my way of thinking about the mind. Like everything right. there is cognitive and it's about true and false, and didn't talk much about emotion or mommy and daddy and death or any of the stuff that actually <laughs> uh, mostly occupies the mind you know, because a lot of the cognitive development, you know, is kind of built in and often takes care of itself. So so yeah, it's about a third of the a third of the picture. And as Greg was mentioning, like, and as John, you said, like, there's a, you know, the merger of reflection and religio, as you were saying, and that represents the possibility for the self-transformation of the culture. 
Yes. Which is no shit. How do you pop? How do you get out of the simulation without having to have it collapse back down to actual hard reality? Well, you have to somehow self transform the culture through reflection in the modality of the religious, I would argue. And this is again a theme of my book is that we're not doing education in the future without dealing with the overwhelmingly religious forms of human thought that basically we need to do that, to do precisely that, <laughs> to deal with the top of cognitive development when we pop out into reflection. Yes. Um, yep. And, and it, is to, it, it, yeah. it's fair, Zach, to then think about what we've been really talking about can translate loosely into the doing competency domain or mode, uh, whereas the being becoming mode will be if we do sort of a Framian overlay on this um, of ensoulment and transcendence, there's the whole being becoming mode that we want to um, mm. juxtapose in potential relation, yeah. or at least that's one lens upon That's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that triple. Yeah, the being would be transcendent and the becoming would be ensoulment and the doing would be cognition, basically. Yeah. That, that I think happens. that's yeah. good. I think we also need to talk about the fact that that the is ought dichotomy is also another dichotomy in high, inherited from the enlightenment that is mm -hmm. seriously under attack right now. Yeah. I mean, you've got Putnam's, you know, the uh, criticisms of the fact value distinction. You've got Case Spears, you know, very devastating argument that, uh, you know, you can't derive is from what? Well, yes, you can. If you put in the missing premise, X is good. And then you have to rely on Moore's argument that, well, whenever I try to defend whenever I say X is good, I can undermine it by, by saying, but is X good, right? Uh, but Moore's argument depends on a very clear analytic synthetic distinction. And Quine has said, no, no, that distinction is absolutely blurred and interpenetrating. And so is and ought are not like the way you know, modernity put them as this chasm and you can't ever go from this. It's not like that. I mean, it, it's, it, they're not identical. Uh, there is a difference. But it's much more, again, this sort of continuum, deep continuity relationship rather than a strict economy. Mm. And I think we need to bring, I, I and, you know, a great conversation. Case bear yeah, argument. I have a lot to say in that. Pardon me? Well, there's a lot there. Like, yeah, yeah. The, I think of Kohlberg's work and then the, the Baskarian work of the mm -hmm. is-ought dialectic, which is extremely important. Um, so yeah. So yeah, I can bring in the case bear and the Putnam, and we can enter that in too, too because I think that's another because again, as I mentioned last time, I find when I try to talk about re relevance, it sits on this boundary that's supposed to be a chasm, yeah. right? <laughs> Between most reasons and puzzles. Stuff. Yeah. It's always bridging the polarity. That's where the most interesting stuff is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, gentlemen, that we all got to say our final piece. This has been excellent as always. And I look forward uh, to our next time together. Thank you very much. See you then. Thank you.